everyone, and welcome to Conversations. Conversations is a bi-monthly program wherein different guest presenters come to speak about a variety of topics. And today we have local Viroqua resident, Dr. David Banner, joining us for a program entitled Informed Race Relations, Insights and Resources. David will be presenting uh, about his books. David is an author, so he wants to speak towards that and speak towards some resources that he knows of. And then additionally to that, I will uh, speak and present about online resources uh, that are of interest. So to introduce David again, this is Dr. David Banner, local Viroqua resident and local author. And we here at the library have been wanting for a long time to get uh, David in to speak towards his books. And uh, so we're so happy that we're finally able to link up. And we're really glad you're here, David, and you have our full attention. And if you'd like to begin. Well, I appreciate it. I'm here in the woods. Uh, by the way, folks, it's, uh, it's about 80 degrees, really nice. <laughs> I'm lying. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Lacey, for giving me an opportunity to, to share this. Uh, I'll, I'll tell all of you uh, about a program that I helped put together years ago, well, not years ago, last year, uh, on recovering from white conditioning. And uh, <clears throat> I grew up in Texas in the South, and just a little background. Uh, I never had the chance to develop a relationship with a person of color because I never saw a person of color in our town of uh, Fort Worth. Uh, all the black and Hispanic people lived on the north side of town and you never even saw uh, folks of color in downtown, it was all white. So I was completely ignorant, uh, admittedly, about uh, people of color and what they go through. And uh, when I was in my PhD program at Northwestern, I had a chance to get to know a, a black man from Georgia and he was just as ignorant as I was of white folk. So we had a really interesting time getting to know each other and stumbling over each other with our different cultural assumptions. So that was a wake up call for me. And then since then, I've been very interested in learning about uh, my privileges as a white person, especially a white male. So I've studied a lot about it uh, and I've got a number of resources. And I know that uh, Lacey is going to talk about resources at the end of my presentation. So uh, there'll be plenty of things for you to look at uh, regarding, <clears throat> regarding how to deal with uh, the assumptions of white supremacy, which we all have. All white people have these assumptions. And, uh, you know, they're hidden for most of us, but there's a chance to bring them to light. And uh, this program that I helped facilitate earlier before COVID was called 12 Step Program in Recovering from White Conditioning. And uh, it was really a good program. Unfortunately, we got very few <clears throat> white people in Viroqua interested in it, which was sad for me, but uh, I did do it with a woman named Claire DeCoster. And she and I presented, I think we did about eight or nine weeks until we just finally decided we got the same three or four people each time. So uh, we let it go, but it is a very good program. And, uh, I want to read something as a way to start us off. This is from the book, Recovering from White Condition. You can't see the book probably, but let me just read something. In a 2014 interview, Ta Nahisi Coates, a senior editor at The Atlantic, explained, we talk about race a lot. We do. You know, I think it's wrong to say we don't talk about it. We do. I don't think we talk about it in depth as much as we should. Part of the problem is that when you start talking about it in depth, when you say everything we are, everything we have is built on past sins, that the things are tied, when we start recognizing that there's something congenital 
is this if we had a problem with alcohol? And I could say, okay, I'm just going to go into the bar and not have a drink. I'm going to be okay. I don't need to have any kind of conversation. That's a different conversation in that I have to confess to the fact that I'm an alcoholic, that there's something in me that's, that, that's there that I will always have, always have to cope with, that I was all, always have to deal with. The honesty that that takes, the courage that that takes, the strength that that takes is pretty profound. And it is. Uh, in, in this program uh, that I help facilitate, uh, I'll read these to you. Uh, we Every week we took a look at all 12 of these and had a conversation about how they impacted us. Uh, so I have lots of notes on insights that I had going through these. It, it's very, very helpful. But let me, uh, let me read these to you very briefly because they're very interesting. Step one, we admitted that we had been socially conditioned by the ideology of white supremacy, that our minds were subject to racial biases. So that's the first step, just like in Alcoholic Anonymous, it's the first step is to realize that you've been conditioned. Number two, we came to believe that we could embrace our ignorance as an invitation to learn. We acknowledge that we as white people will never know what it feels like to walk in the world as a person of color. And it's true, we won't, we'll never know. We develop support systems to keep us engaged in this work. And that's what we were attempting to do with our program here in Baroque, is to build support systems so that we could have conversations uh, about living in a world that's uh, a white, supremacists dominated. Number four, we journal, journeyed boldly inward, exploring and acknowledging ways in which white supremacist teachings have been integrated into our minds and spirits. And this was very interesting, this number four. So we had lots of insights, all, all of us who were at the meeting about ways in which subtly we were ingrained with this idea that white is good and, and people of color are not. <clears throat> then we, number five, we confessed our mistakes and failings to ourselves and others. That was also a really good one. A lot of us had got in touch with the fact that we, out of our ignorance of our white supremacist advantages, we had said things, done things that had been very hurtful to people of color. So that was an interesting and very fruitful number five. Number six, we are entirely ready to deconstruct previous ways of knowing as they have been developed through the lens of white supremacy. This is another good one. We, we had to let go of our knowledge that we had acquired that was tinged with white supremacist thinking. There was a lot to be revealed on that too. Number seven, we humbly explored new ways of understanding, proactively seeking out new learning and reconstructing a more inclusive sense of reality. Lots of conversations about learning to be more deeply understand the experience of people of color in a white supremacist society. So that was also a really good one. Number eight, we committed ourselves to ongoing study of our racial biases, conscious or unconscious, and our maladaptive patterns of white supremacist thinking. Another good one. Number nine, we just developed strategies to counteract our racial biases. That was a really good one, uh, where we, we realized that the most powerful way to develop associations is to develop authentic relationships with people of color. Uh, it's been challenging for me because I was so ignorant and I grew up in such a white society, but I am seeking to do that. And every time I do it, it's rewarding. Number 10, we embrace the responsibility of focusing on our impact rather than our intent in interactions with people of color. That's a really good one because we may have good intentions, but can be very hurtful to people of color, unintentionally. 
So uh, developing an awareness of that was really helpful. We engage number 11 in daily practices of self-reflection, which means going through your day and seeing how these biases show up in your interactions with people of color. Very good. And the last one, 12, we committed ourselves to sharing this message with our white brothers and sisters in order to build a supportive recovery community and to encourage personal accountability within our culture. So those are all really, really good ones. Uh, we, as I say, we had a uh, quite a spirited conversation. I took plenty of notes. <laughs> if anybody's interested in any of this stuff, uh, you, you can get all this stuff online in www.recoveringfromwhiteconditioning.com. You get all these resources, the 12 steps, everything. So in the second half of the portion, um, I wanted <clears throat> to highlight some, quite a few actually different online resources for anyone who is interested in directing themselves there to learn more and to become um, informed. And of course, this is not a um, complete outline of all of the websites out there. Um, however, I, the websites that I've selected, I have done so because I reference them quite often. They're from accredited, well-known resources ranging from internationally to national, um, academic, and then moving into um, resources for educators, and then coming in even more locally into this lacrosse area, and then right here in Viroqua. So I'd like to go ahead and begin to highlight these. This first res resource here is facing, excuse me, facinghistory.org. So with each of these uh, resources I'll show you as well, quite often they each have their own niche. And I'd like to encourage you to visit them yourselves. There's always a lot of information, um, but I will point out what I generally uh, use from these and where I go on them. So Facing History and Ourselves is an international organization, which is why I'm starting with it. Um, I really enjoy using this one. It does offer professional development um, which I think is, is fairly unique for this website. If I can wake my computer up here. Um, right. So facing history in ourselves, um, definitely historical, but very, very modern, very current, um, offering these professional development courses. Um, and online courses as well. I like that they offer courses to take. Uh, secondly here, we have Learning for Justice. This is formally known as Teaching Tolerance, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, they have only very, very recently within the past week or two, um, retitled their organization. Um, so now known as Learning for Justice, uh, they have a Facebook group, which I see every day, really incredible, meaningful information coming through. I would say that I, I view their website at least every day. It seems so relevant and always updating, always new content, um, just really pretty incredible. Again, with a lot of classroom resources as well. Furthermore, we have the zinedproject.org. Um, this is a history teachings here. And what I enjoy about this is that they really have a lot of different time periods to choose from. So you can see here in this top bar, you can really use all of these different filters to get very specific about what you're looking for. Okay, let's see here. Uh, moving on, we have the um, National Education Association. So moving into more uh, resources for educators here. Um, 
really wonderfully the National Education Association having a page specifically for racial and social justice. Um, you can get really deep in here, everything from, um, you know, classes for uh, preschool children and then working up through all of the different grades. They're covering a lot of current topics as well. Now I'd like to move on to the other one, but please be patient with me. I need to be able to uh, get it here. All right. So here is the PBS Learning Media Org. I just took a webinar on um, PBS Learning Media specifically for Wisconsin. And I was really blown away. I, I think this is such an interactive uh, resource here with the um, social studies. So what PBS has set up here is a lot of different short videos, really, um, that could be very engaging for classrooms and for anybody who's interested in general. They, PBS has really done, put a lot of pursuit towards um, covering very current uh, social and racial um, justice events. Um, to stay very modern and relevant, especially for students right now. Furthermore, um, the contact that I have, uh, professional contact that I have at PBS Learning Media in Wisconsin, would like to make it available a 30 minute um, workshop on this. So if anyone out there is interested in that, please contact me and we can set up a class for that. All right, and of course we have the NAACP founded in 1909, W.E.B. Dubois. Um, here, I, uh, they have a lot of the take action. So what I find in this resource is that there are plenty of important, uh, current relevant petitions. You can find your ways to those. You can really dig in to um, political aspects from this website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really very meaningful work done here through this organization. All right. Um, also Brown Academy. So when you, um, there's a lot to see here, of course, but with their videos, 180 some videos, I believe is what they have on their YouTube channel. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, also interracial. And you can see here a lot of discussions. They have so much content, very exciting. Um, specifically working from their Center for Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. Okay. Uh, still interesting and engaging for everyone. We are working now our way towards um, some cultural websites. Here we have the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is a Smithsonian museum. Um, I have not been able to visit this one yet, but what's great is they do have their virtual exhibits. Uh, of course, that kicked up um, probably primarily last, uh, last spring, but here they have, you can still visit the website um, virtually, or the, excuse me, the museum virtually. But there, of course. We had an opportunity a couple of years ago to go to this museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a real mind-blowing experience because you get a real look at and a feel for the history of Black people in this country, and all the slave ships and the whole thing. It's really, it, it brings tears to your eyes, really, to see what uh, mm. folks have gone through uh, mm. coming to the U.S. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, David. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I believe here with this explore button, certainly a way here to jump in and see there. 
Um, also, this came through um, the Smithsonian Magazine. There are other art exhibits to be seen uh, virtually right now. Uh, as you can see here, the title is Eight Online Exhibits to See Right Now on Black History, Racism, and and protest. Um, I explored this. This is an article that came over the summer. Yeah, it was June 30th that I found this one, but wanted to share it because the educational experience and because do that um, safely right now, that I wanted to uh, point this one out. So smithsonianmagazine.com, you could Google um, eight online exhibits to visit about Black history, racism, and protest. There's another museum. Um, oh, yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah. uh, so this was is the National Museum of African American Music um, in Nashville. And this museum had been set to open to the public. It was a, it's a brand new facility. It was going to open to the public, I believe in spring of 2020 and of course we all know how that lines up so they had not been been able to open until just very very recently um, so i think this could be an incredible incredible destination um, to look forward to once we can all get out <laughs> um, but also they you're able to visit their galleries and um, african-american music um, so they have digital and audio galleries as well. But as I would mentioned, um, brand new facility. Um, I think that's really exciting. And here we have the history makers. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this one, but also is a collection of audio um, oral video videos. So what's uh, happening here is stream makers have these digital archives. And within the digital archives, you can um, hear from different makers as this organization calls them or refers to people by. And I'll pull that up so you can see what I am talking about here. Here you can see there are 3,311 biographies. Um, so you can uh, research people by their names, hear from them, hear their voices. Um, a very large repertoire of uh, professional uh, people. And here, okay, here on the side, if you look on the left side, you can see art makers, business makers, civic makers, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're looking um, to meet or hear from somebody <laughs> in a specific, uh, of a specific interest, you can find so through here on the left side. Mm -hmm. um, and also to mention just briefly, that um, we have a local connection to history makers. Um, the local Viroqua resident, his name is Dr. Kelvin Morris, is featured on this website for um, his lifetime work in um, racial justice and social justice movements, including being the director, the former director of the Bread Basket Project in Chicago. Um, so now moving a little bit locally and just let y'all know we're a little bit more than halfway through this portion of the presentation. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, this is called lacrossewakingupwhite.com. So this is an initiative um, happening in lacrosse, a, a project essentially of a, a regionally, a regional wide book reading and the book that they're featuring is Waking Up White by Deborah Irving. 
But beyond that, they're also um, having public events. So public events happening regionally, locally here for us. Um, and you can see those listed here on the left side. I think that's just really incredible to know about. So here again is this regional read that I was speaking of, Waking Up White, um, the White Privilege Symposium of 2021, and then more of their initiative projects for creating a healthier multicultural community. Um, all of this was scheduled uh, to have happened this previous fall, but due to COVID, they've been rescheduling it as of course many things had been. Um, but yeah, I've been pretty tuned in to this organization um, for months and months. And I think that they are very much and excited to, um, to get all of this happening in person as soon as they can. But for now, these all virtual events happening, um, discussing local subjects. Okay, furthermore, the, uh, the Greater La Crosse Area Diversity Council, so exciting. Um, <clears throat> so with this um, very regional uh, projects and uh, initiative organization, um, they have all of their different resources that they list. There is one in particular that I will show you in the next screen, um, but really, in really so glad to have this kind of resource um, specifically about our area available to us. Um, so let me go ahead and show you all that resource that I previously mentioned, which is right here. This again coming from the GLCADC, their multicultural resource guide. Yes, from 2017 to 2018, but here we go. Check out their table of content. So what they've done here is they've gone ahead and organized um, different businesses, services, events, cultural activities into an organized fashion so that we can reach out to different organizations um, that are based here locally if we are so interested in doing that. So I think this is a tremendous local resource. And I often go here to um, find contact information for people that um, may become potential guest presenters. And on that note, that segues right into the La Crosse County Historical Society's Enduring Families Project. Um, so what this is here, is through the La Crosse Historical Society. There's a group of uh, writers, producers, actors, and actresses that are creating these short biographical films of historical African-American figures in the La Crosse area. And uh, we have, you can, uh, from this website, you can view their different videos here. They have five right now. They've also been putting together um, different Black history audio tours for the La Crosse area. How awesome is that? And then here is um, their historical writer, Rebecca, and their project uh, organizer, Denise. Denise and I had a wonderful conversation the other day. Um, she's informed me that they have wonderful, the group itself has wonderful interest intentions to um, focus on the hist Vernon County history, and that would be the history of Cheyenne Valley. So if you keep that in your mind, I'll be mentioning Cheyenne Valley again here in a moment. But excellent, excellent resource to find out about um, historical figures, uh, that being people um, in the La Crosse area. All right, then we're gonna hop right into, it comes up here. This here is the library's YouTube channel. So you'll see here, um, what I have up on the screen right now is the promotional video for Creating Community Beyond Biases Library Resources, which is this library's year-long all ages 
Humanities Program that month by month acknowledges a different heritage, um, history, or an awareness of February now uh, being Black History and African American Heritage Month. And then we also, you can see here, we on the right side, we have a playlist for each month featuring different authors or resources, again, for educators. Um, and then here, with special permission from the Enduring Families Project, uh, we, receive, we are able to um, co-share their exact uh, videos that they have put together here on the right. So we're very, um, very happy and excited to have been granted that permission to include their videos in our list. And of course, if you'd like more information about creating community beyond bias as library resources, we can speak about that briefly after this presentation and or you could contact me independently for more information. Very happy to speak with you. Um, also here is a part of creating community beyond bias as library resources. This, what you're seeing right here is um, a platform called Beanstack. Beanstack is accessed through this library's homepage website. And the reason to access it is because this uh, platform, Beanstack, in your own Beanstack account, you will receive the curated book lists um, that the library produces every month for the specific um, acknowledgement of that month. So here we go. Under recommendations, so I'm in my own personal account right now showing, showing you that under recommendations is where you will find the book lists. And here is a sampling of the book lists that we have um, curated for you. To speak a little bit more specifically about that, each book list is organized by different age groups, that being youth or young adult slash teen or adult. And then for each month, we're providing library resources and um, lists, these book lists, um, which range. So you can see, for example, February, we have included here librarian picks. Okay, that's great. But we also have Black history specific, Black voices specific, Black voices meaning um, authors who are African American, authors who are speaking about um, the Black experience in the United States. And then you can see we still have the library list for the January in which we acknowledged and celebrated East Asian Heritage Month. Um, we do oftentimes include specific books um, for specific topics or subjects, or, or in this instance, a person, Dr. Martin Luther King. So then each age group is going to also have um, their own um, of these, each of these lists as well. So for youth, for example, we do have books that are written specifically for youth readers about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., about um, January East Asian Heritage Month, about Black voices, about Black history, and about anti-racism. And we have librarian picks for each uh, age group as well. In order for these books to be appearing on the list, they have to have come from an, an accredited resource such as the American Library Association and or be awarded books from literary organizations. And they have to be in the library's collection. So when you go to the list, you know that you're finding not only high quality, meaningful books about relevant subjects, but that we also have them and you can get them. All right, enough on that. Let's go here to, um, I had mentioned the Enduring Families Project is wanting to um, put together a film, uh, a film about Vernon County. And what that is, is Vernon County has um, how to say this. So historically, 
Vernon County has had a multiracial community that formed in the mid 1800s. And this multiracial community lived in the Cooley of Cheyenne, so Cheyenne Valley. And um, the ancestors or the descendants, excuse me, the descendants of these pioneers and settlers of Cheyenne Valley um, have a historical society, essentially. And that is known, this is their Facebook page, and that is known as the Cheyenne Settlers Heritage Society. So this exact plaque right here can be found in the park in Hillsboro, which is in Eastern Vernon County. And that is also where Cheyenne Valley was in that general area of the county. But you can see here that they, um, they host large family reunions, um, they have presenters come in. Cheyenne Valley is, um, is well document, documented through the Wisconsin Historical Society because it was one of a, the first and few multiracial, meaning also African American settlement um, of Wisconsin in that time frame in the mid 1850s. Um, very prominent from the 1850s about until about 1920 um, for the reason that the families that settled there, you know, generation by generation grew and expanded for schooling and marriage. Um, and still now there are a few of those um, descendants of the original settlers who live in the Hillsborough area and also in La Crosse. Um, interestingly, and very proudly, the library has been working um, with and collaborating with the Vernon Historical Society, the Cheyenne Settlers Heritage Society and Vernon Communications uh, to put together what we call a photographic video essay, which is about, which is entitled African American Heritage in Vernon County. And this will be premiering by the end of this month. Okay, and then um, David, I believe this is the, is, is, does this look familiar to you, David? That's the thing I was introducing. Yep, so there we go. And I wanted to touch on this as well, that if you go to overcomingracism.org, you are able to download this PV, PDF, um, which I assume, David, hopefully you can clarify, is what you had been using yeah. in your discussion group. Is that correct? Yep, that's what we use. Okay, great. That's a whole well, and, All right, there we go. Well, thank you all for going on that um, journey there through about 20 different resources, but I have so much appreciation and respect for each one of them. And I'm so excited and delighted that I can take the time, take time within my day to visit these sites um, for their informational and educational um, values and uh, offerings. So I hope there was at least one or a few in there that um, you feel inspired to have a look at more.